From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. This is where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. The political die is cast as the House is set to vote tomorrow morning on the $1.9 trillion stimulus package and then send it to President Biden for signature later this week. For the scorecard on who wins and who loses politically, at least, we welcome now our political contributor, Jeannie Sean Zeno of Iona College. Professor Zeno is the author of American Democracy in Crisis. So, Jeannie, always wonderful to have you with us. So, who wins and who loses. It looks like President Biden did all right. He did very well. This is the bill he talked about as president-elect, and almost word for word, he got everything he wanted in this bill. And he's going to come out, as you know, Thursday night, he's going to be talking about, and I think he believes, like you just said, he's going to be celebrating signing this bill, which even Bernie Sanders said is a historic piece of legislation for working families. So it's a lot bigger than just COVID relief. Jeannie, is there any risk here at all for the whitest in this sense? They own this economy now. They've stepped up big time to do it. They've got to hope that this really delivers what they hoped. They have to hope that, and they have to hope that they can get Joe Manchin to work with them so that they can make good on their Build Back Better promise, including everything from infrastructure, you know, critically infrastructure, but also issues including immigration, jobs, and others. So this is the start, they hope, of something big, but that's difficult with a 50-50 Senate. So Joe Manchin, of course, is a Democrat from West Virginia. I assume he's going to run again for office, but there are five, count them, five Republican senators thus far who've said we're not going to do it, including Roy Blunt, who is a member of leadership. What is going on with that? I think this is the Republicans indicating that they don't want to have these loyalty fights with the Trump base as they move into the next set of primaries. As you mentioned, Blunt is the fifth. We're still waiting to see if Chuck Grassley decides to run again or retire. And importantly, these are like the establishment institutional sort of, if you will, old style, not old, old style Republicans who simply are leaving the Senate saying they've had enough. And in a state like Missouri, you expect they're going to be replaced by people more in line with Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley in the Trump sort of wing. You know, let's not forget Trump won Missouri by about 15 points. So this is a huge change for the Republican Party in the Senate. So, so that's exactly what I'm curious about, Jeannie. Does this potentially, we don't know where it ends up, potentially mean a shift to the Republican Party? And I'm not even sure I'd say to the right, but more to the populist direction for the entire party. It does. It's a shift towards what President Trump had been talking about and selling. And I think the retirement of these five, potentially six, is the strongest indication that they do not want to be involved in these, as I mentioned, primary fights that are going to, you know, be impacting potentially people like Lisa Murkowski and people like Liz Cheney. And Trump has a lot of power in this party. He's pushing it towards the populist wing of the party. And that seems to be where the energy and a lot of the money is at this point. So big, big civil war for the Republicans. And it looks like Trump and his allies are doing pretty well so far in that. Okay, Jeannie, thank you so much for being with us. That's Bloomberg political contributor Jeannie Sean Zeno. And remember to tune in this Friday to a special edition of Wall Street Week. We're going to devote the entire program to President Biden's stimulus package. That's coming up Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. But right now, I want to go to the White House and get their view on what's happening. We welcome back now Cedric Richmond. He's director of the Office of Public Engagement and a senior advisor to President Biden. So I I I'm tempted to congratulate you. I bet you'd be the first to say not until it's over. But you're pretty darn close to it's being over. How are you feeling, Cedric? We're excited, and we're excited for the American people. Uh, president Biden has talked about this plan and the need to get this passed since before he was president. He pushed this bill uh, to the Congress, and asked for them to pass it. And the bill will pretty much come out uh, at the same $1.9 trillion that it went in. But we just know what it means to American families. An American family of four, two parents that probably make $100,000 together with two children, uh, will get a check for, check for $5,400. Not to mention that they'll get 2,600 additional dollars in uh, child tax credit. So we're talking about really helping American families when they meet it, need it the most. So that's why we're excited about it. So this was directed, obviously, at correcting for the pandemic. But it also could do something for child poverty, as I understand, in this country. Is this, in your view, a fundamental shift, potentially, toward how we support a lot of those families who are hurting? We certainly hope so. Uh, there are a couple of things that... Uh, Vice President Biden now uh, believes are value statements. One, no one should work 40 hours a week and not make above the poverty line. And we shouldn't have children living in poverty. And so the American Rescue Plan would reduce child poverty in this country by 50 percent. 
And we think that that is something that we should continue to strive to improve on because that's who we are. And that's certainly uh, who this administration uh, is and will continue to be. So, so as you know, Mr. Richmond, well, part of this bill actually enhances the Affordable Care Act, at least for a two-year period, really subsidizes some of those payments for the exchanges, things like that. Do you have hopes, does the White House have hopes, that that could be extended beyond the limited period of this bill? Look, just look at what it does. When that same family that I just talked about, when they go to re-enroll in June, uh, they would save almost $600 a month in terms of their health care costs. And so think of all the things that a family of four could do saving $600 a month. And so that's what we're focused on. And of course, our goal is to continue to bring health care costs down in this country because we believe that affordable health care is a right. It's not a privilege. And every step we can take towards that, we're going to continue to do that. Do you have any reservations at all, something that you're concerned about might not work as well as you hope? No, I don't. Look, we're going to be as efficient and as effective as we possibly can with this legislation. We're going to try to get checks out the door as fast as we possibly can. We know that this is not about the administration. We know that this is not about us talking about it. This is about us doing it. And so we have to get these checks out in the mail. We have to provide all of this other relief. We have to get children back in school so that their parents can go to work. We can reduce the trauma to the children and reduce the kids that are falling behind. So we know we have a million and one things to do, and we have to do it in just a couple of days. So that's what we're really focused and on. In this bill, you're providing a lot of money for public education to get the kids back in school. There are still some teachers unions that seem to be reluctant to go back. Is there anything the White House can do, even if it's in the form of using the bully pulpit, to say to the teachers union, it's time to get the kids back in school? Look, we're doing everything we can to get uh, our schools back open safely. So we have prioritized teacher vaccinations. We've put in $130 billion in for K through 12 so that we can open those schools up safely with ventilation systems, social distancing, partitions, uh, all of the things that would be necessary to open them up. And, and we have been very clear since day one that if Congress approved the funding, that it was our goal to get a majority of the K through 12 schools in this country open within the first 100 days. We think we're on track to get that done but we're not satisfied where we are. We want all schools open, and we want them open as quickly as possible, but we also want to keep our teachers safe. So I understand the bill's not been signed into law yet, but it's not too early to ask what comes next. Tell me about Build Back Better. You must be working on that in the White House, just behind you there. Well, I'll tell you, the president's done everything he said he was going to do during the campaign. He said he wanted to pass this COVID relief bill, and then he wanted to build back better. So, uh, yes, we're talking about what Build Back Better looks like in terms of infrastructure investments, creating jobs, fixing a broken America, putting in infrastructure for if something like this would ever happen again. So it, it's about doing a, a bunch of things. But uh, our first priority is to pass this bill, and then we will work on building back better. Yeah, and I, I recognize he hasn't signed into law yet, although it looks like that's going to happen. At the same time, my understanding is you could get the, uh, the stimulus package through on a 50 vote uh, in the Senate, plus, of course, the vice president. You're not going to be able to do that and build back better, right? Don't you need the 60 votes on that? Well, look, I, and I won't get into all of the thinking of the White House. I will just tell you this. Uh, I will quote my grandmother, who used to always say, where there's the will, there's a way. And we have the will to make sure that we build back better, that we invest in this country, invest in American workers, American infrastructure, and all of those things, because we know that the American Rescue Plan is not just enough. So it's going to stop us. It's going to help the economy in the short term. But we are looking far down the road and fundamentally changing who wins in America. We want everybody to win, and we don't want to leave anybody behind. So that's why it's called Build Back Better, because we have to build back better than what we had before. And I have no doubt that you and the president and the entire team have the will to get this done. But I guess what I'm saying is you need at least 10 Republicans to have that same will. Do you see that possibility with a significant Build Back Better plan? Well, we certainly hope so. And we've been talking to them about it. Uh, we've invited them down. And at some point, uh, we hope that everybody will put country first. And so we know America's hurting. We know America has needs. And we're going to step up to the plate and we're going to do it. And we're not going to try to go solo. We would hope that Republicans would come along with us and independents. Uh, but to the extent that we are required to go solo, then we may have to do that. But that's not our first choice. Our first choice is to have a bipartisan uh, bill 
that builds back better, invests in American families. Okay, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, Mr. Richmond. That's Cedric Richmond. He's a senior advisor to President Biden. Coming up, we talk with Senator Rick Scott of Florida about the stimulus package and about how many of us in New York have moved to his state to flee the pandemic. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for a check on the markets. For that, we turn to, Abigail's, to Abigail Doolittle. So, Abigail, I'm going to paraphrase Mark Twain. Uh, those reports of a NASDAQ correction seem to be greatly exaggerated, I would say, today. <laughs> today, we're see certainly seeing a big bounce back, David, especially for technology. That tech-heavy NASDAQ up about 4%. It's best day since November 4th. Yesterday, down about the same amount, the worst day uh, in quite some time. So you have these huge, huge moves. The one that really stands out at this point, the Golden Dragon China ETF, that's a, a tech China ETF based company ETF. Uh, it is up more than 6%. It's best day, David, since 2009. That's the kind of buying. But yesterday, down 7%, the worst day since March of last year. All of this has to do with rates, these wild moves that we're seeing in rates. When yields go higher, as you know, it brings into question evaluation. Uh, but when they go lower, those questions leave. Now, it's not even a big move, it's a four basis point move, but it's enough to stir the animal spirits around technology. Not so much. Though for banks, banks one of the best sectors on the year today, taking a little bit of breather as yields come in, David. Yeah, that yield curve really helps. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. Well, the vote on the Biden stimulus package went strictly along party lines. Welcome now one of those who voted against it. He's Republican Senator Rick Scott of Florida. Senator, always a delight to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. So it's a done deal, it looks like, at this point. It looks like the president will probably sign it sometime this week. Uh, are, you, are you thinking they have to be careful what they wish for here? Well, it's, it's disappointing. You know, you're the, the last person on talked about bipartisanship. I mean, ten of my colleagues went to the White House to sit down with President Biden and said, let's work together. We did five uh, stimulus bills last year, all on a bipartisan basis, and they said, no, we're going to do it by ourselves. The Democrats did it by itself. It was clearly not what the American public expected. It was not, it was not a focused bill, a targeted bill. We need to help the people who have lost their jobs. We need to help our small businesses. But no, it was a payback to New York and California. I mean, think about what they've done with these state bailouts. Our state revenues are equal to what the year, the year before. We've already given our states $400 billion plus, and they just gave them another $360 billion, and they gave more to states like New York and California than states like my home state of Florida. But, I mean, it, it makes no sense how unfair this, this is to the American public. And by the way, you know what they didn't talk about? How are they going to pay for it? We have $28 trillion of the debt. This is going to take our debt to $30 trillion, right? Did they, they, they don't want to talk about how they're going to pay for it, and now they're going to want to go do an infrastructure bill. I mean, there's a day of reckoning here. You can't just raise debt. I mean, if you look, if interest rates are 1.6% the 10-year, that means just interest expense a year is like 480, almost $500 billion out of a federal revenue source of a little over $3 trillion. I mean, this, they're, not, they're not explaining what's going to happen with inflation, which means if we have high inflation, the poor families, those on fixed income seeds, food prices go up. Oh, by the way, gas prices are already up because of the Biden administration. They don't want to talk about that either. So I'm, I'm, I'm very disappointed that the, the Democrats and the Biden administration did not want to do a focused bill that would help the American public. So, I, you know, I'm, you know, we're going to keep working hard here. I'm optimistic about the future of this country, but I'm worried about higher interest rates, which will cause your mortgage to go up, your car, you know, cost of, your, your car payment to go up, and we're going to see in, possibly see inflation, which hurts our poorest families. And that's what I want to talk about. Do you see any potential political consequences, a price to be paid for this? And let's be frank, Senator, when it comes to running up the deficit, Republicans have done all right as well as Democrats. It hasn't oh. just been the Democrats who have run up the deficit. Absolutely. I mean, there, there's a day of reckoning. You, I mean, who in their right mind believes that you can just keep borrowing money year after year? When I was governor of Florida, I stopped it. The, prior, the 20 years before I became governor of Florida, they had raised the debt a billion dollars year after year, every year for 20 years. In my eight years, we paid off a third of the state debt. We reduced our interest expenses. But if you look at this, I mean, 
how are we going to pay for the things we care about? We, want, we need to have a strong military. We need to make sure we take care of Social Security and Medicare. When you're already now going to have almost $500 billion of interest expense and you only collect a little over $3 trillion, how do you pay for the programs that Americans want? So I, I'm, I think that what, they're, what the Democrats won't tell you is they're, they're coming back with massive tax increases. And how is that going to help people, the, you know, families all across our country? How is it going to help us get more jobs? People want jobs. They want a good economy. So it's, I'm, I'm really concerned about what they're doing. It's not good for our country. Um, and I'm going to keep fighting to make sure we take care of every family in this country. Senator, you mentioned the fairness or unfairness in the treatment of Florida and New York, for example, you mentioned. Uh, there were some people in New York who felt that the SALT, the, the state and local tax limitation, was not fair to New York. But one of the things that we're parochially concerned about is people moving from New York down to Florida, some of the high-income individuals. fair number of people have done that. Are you concerned at all that they may move right back again once the pandemic's over? Well, for, David, let's go to basically to the salt. Why would, why would Florida taxpayers, basically the way it was set up, why would we pay a portion of local, of, of state taxes? Why would we do that? By the way, Andrew Cuomo and I got elected at the same time as governor in, in 2010. You know what he did his eight years? Increased, he never balanced the budget except by borrowing money. He raised taxes every year. And what happened? People left. People were coming to Florida for a variety of reasons. Some because of our weather, some because of our taxes, some because there's job opportunities. But, but if you, you look at it, you can't have, take New York. New York's expenses, their state budget per person is almost double Florida's, double. And by the way, Florida's number one in higher education. We're way better than New York. We're in the top five for K-12 education. Our transportation, our roads are better. Yeah. I mean, what's what Andrew Cuomo doing? He's, I mean, he's just, he's, he's causing so many people to live, to, or to move. I mean, I sent him thank yous when, when I was governor. I sent him thank yous when he raised taxes because more people come to Florida. Yeah, fair point, Senator. But one thing that we hear uh, every time this is brought up from, for, from New Yorkers are, it's a good deal for the federal government. Because, in fact, if you look at the dollars flowing from New York to the federal government as opposed to from the federal government back to New York, it's a much better deal for the federal government than it is for Florida. You know what? You know, when they do those studies, you know what they do is they, they look at Medicare and, and, and Social Security. Well, people, you, know, you see what people are doing. They pay into the Medicare program or Social Security when they're in New York, and they say, this is these taxes are ridiculous. I'm moving. I'm going to Florida. And then they receive those, those dollars back when they get to Florida. When they take those numbers out, which they don't want to do, it, it, it looks totally different. Hmm. By the way, I mean, I'll give you just an example. On Medicaid, per enrollee for Medicaid, which is generally paid half and half between the federal government and the states, New York gets paid double what Florida gets per enrollee out of the federal government. So it's, it's the opposite. Florida is the one that's paying in. And New York, when you take out Medicare, which it's not, it's, it's not paid by the state. The, you know, the state government doesn't pay any of this stuff. The citizens pay these things. And it's, you're paying into a program. And then you move and you get the benefit of that program. Just before we let you go, I want to ask about China. We've talked about China a fair amount before. What would be your advice to the Biden administration right now about how to deal with China? Let me ask you a very specific question. Should we consider not having our athletes go to China for the Olympics, just the way Canada at least is considering that? We should not boycott the Olympics. But what we should do is make sure we get the Olympics moved. Uh, by the way, I'm, I, I had an Armed Services Committee hearing today. Guess what all was about? It's about the Chinese military. How about they are building a military to dominate the world? They're not building a military to defend themselves. They're building a military to, to, to take control of the entire world. We're spending dollars to, to put ourselves in a position that that doesn't happen. So we, we need to hold them accountable for all the bad deeds, but especially the genocide of the Uyghurs. I mean, they're, 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 they're trying to just kill off the, the entire Uyghur population through sterilization of the women, through, through taking away the children. I mean, it's just disgusting what they're doing. So why would the International Olympic Committee ever let Communist China hold an Olympics? We need, to, we need to not boycott, but we need to say these things have got to be moved to a country that believes in human rights. Okay, Senator, as I say, it's always a delight to have you with us and helpful as well. Senator Rick Scott, he's Republican of Florida. Coming up here, President Biden is doubling down on his predecessor's challenge to big tech. We'll discuss who he's looking to put at the FTC. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The Biden administration is vetting Columbia Law Professor Lina Khan for appointment to the Federal Trade Commission, someone who has been outspoken on her views about antitrust policy and challenging big tech. To take us through the possible ramifications of this move, we welcome now Jennifer Rhee. She's senior analyst for antitrust litigation at Bloomberg Intelligence. Jen, great to have you with us as always. Boy, if I were Amazon or I were Google or I was Facebook this morning, I'm not sure I'd be happy with this news. No, not at all. And thanks for having me, David. You know, I have to think across all the big tech platforms uh, leadership, there's been a sigh today and hearing this news because, you know, Lena Khan, as you said, she's been vocal about what she thinks about the antitrust laws and in particular the dominance of big tech platforms um, and, you know, where she thinks thinks things ought to go. So installing her at the FTC, you know, a clear progressive, somebody who advocates, you know, what's been called the new Brandeis approach, um, shows that the Biden administration is not going to go easy on big tech. Yeah, and she's not alone. We have Tim Wu, who also was at Columbia, who wrote a book on the Brandeis approach, and he's now over at the National Economic Council. Right. That's exactly right. So those two appointments together show the direction this administration's going. And I think, you know, early on there were some doubts that they would continue to go as hard on big tech as the sort of the end of the Trump administration. But now it's pretty clear that they are. You know, we have to remember, though, that to me at the FTC, the most important appointment is going to be the chairperson. And we don't know who that's going to be yet. I, I actually haven't seen any speculation in the news. Because she's going, Lena Khan is going to take the place of Rohit Chopra, a current commissioner who's been now nominated to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And really, their views are pretty much the same. You know, they're aligned. They've even written, written um, in the Chicago Law Journal together on some of these issues. And so she's replacing him. He's been expressing his opinions and dissents for the last four years. Yeah. So, and we need a three to two vote. We need a majority vote to take any action at the FTC. So whether or not that chairperson is a progressive or a moderate could really tell us what direction things are going to go in. Yeah, it's a really good point, Jennifer. It is not over till it's over. And you not only have the chair of the FTC yet to be appointed, but also the assistant attorney general for antitrust, who also could have a different point of view. We'll have to wait really to know what's going on until we see those two appointments. Jennifer Rhee of Bloomberg Intelligence. Jen, thank you so very much for being with us. Really appreciate it. Coming up, we're talking vaccination distribution and how two companies have partnered up to handle things themselves in the state of North Carolina. We're going to speak with the CEO of one of those companies next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. The Biden administration is now looking ahead to its next stimulus package, and it will face more obstacles than the one that's on the verge of getting through Congress without a single Republican vote. It will address infrastructure, climate, health care, inequality, and more. But Republican opposition to tax hikes will make it harder to pay for it all. The measure will be unveiled after the president signs the coronavirus relief bill. There's been more fallout in the wake of last month's massive blackouts in Texas. The agency that oversees the state's power sector is uh, known to a single regulator after two of three members resigned. The energy disaster crippled the electric grid, cut power to millions during the deep winter freeze, and left dozens dead. And allegations of overcharging customers has forced one utility into bankruptcy and left the state's power market with a $2.4 billion shortfall. In Canada, more voters trust Justin Trudeau's party to manage the country's finances after the pandemic than any other. It's a boost of polling confidence that could tempt him to trigger an election. The governing liberals earned 33% support in a Illinois research group survey for Bloomberg News, the result gives the prime minister a strong edge over his main rival, Aaron O'Toole, whose conservatives were chosen by 24 percent of respondents. When the Olympic Games kick off in Tokyo this summer, there won't be any overseas spectators in the stands. Japan's national news agency says the government has decided to ban fans from abroad over concerns about the coronavirus and different variants detected in other countries. 
Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thank you so much, Mark. Mm -hmm. Vaccinations are picking up around the country, but some companies haven't waited for the government to step things up. In North Carolina, Honeywell has been partnering with Atrium, one of the largest healthcare systems in the country. And we talked earlier this year with Honeywell CEO Darius Adamchuk about this partnership they have in North Carolina. We've partnered with a couple of great institutions in the Panthers and Atrium Health and with David Tepper and Gene Woods, who lead those organizations. And, uh, we want to open up a mass vaccination center in Charlotte at Bank of America Stadium. And we're also very proud to, to partner with the Motor Speedway. We're going to do a little bit of a pilot run. We welcome now Mr. Adam Chuck's a partner in the effort. He is Eugene Woods, CEO of Atrium Health. So welcome, Gene. It's really great to have you with us. He told us that you guys, I think, actually went for a walk and cooked, cooked this up. When we talked to him, it was in the pilot stage. It was back in, in January. Where is it now? Yeah, well, we've just had two of, I think, one of the most successful mass vaccination events in the country. That walk led to a, a conversation we had with the governor uh, that Wednesday. We, we, we talked on Sunday. We had a plan for the governor on, on Wednesday, and, and thankfully, uh, he approved it the next day. So at Bank of America and the Charlotte Motor Speedway, we vaccinated about 36,000 uh, people uh, in, in a couple of weekends. Uh, we put a shot in arms every 4.5 seconds. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a tribute to the, the partnerships between health systems and businesses like this and how we can really uh, step up working with government at a time like this when, when the country needs us most. I will say, David, um, the, the moment that I saw the first shot go into an arm, the only way I could describe it is the best, the best day of my 30-year career. Mm -hmm. This is actually the vial. Uh, uh, but I will pass on to my grandchildren, if you will, well, to say that this is the time, uh, this is the moment where we, 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 we turn the corner here. What a great story. Have you had any trouble getting enough vaccine? Because some places have had some difficulty with that. Yeah, the challenge has been from the beginning is getting enough vaccines. I think uh, you see uh, things ramping up, and so we're excited about that. Now, really, it's just a, it's a distribution issue. I do have concerns that we need to... to to take a state like North Carolina, we have about 10 million people in North Carolina. Uh, if you take out the 2 million that are 16 and under, we've got to vaccinate about, um, you know, 90 percent to get uh, herd, herd immunity. So that's 8 million. So that's about 7 million or so that we need to get vaccinated. And we've gotten uh, 1.5 shots in arms, 1.5 million shots in arms so far. So we, we still got a ways to go. That said, we went from about the bottom 15 in terms of states to number one uh, last week in terms of um, over 65 getting shots in arms. So we're going to continue this path. And as, as supply becomes more plentiful, I think we're going to be able to continue uh, to use mass, mass vaccination sites to, to get Shots and arms before this, this variant comes into play, which is what concerns me. Are you getting any resistance at all? Because we hear some descriptions that could be 15, 20, even 25 percent of the population that just isn't really interested in getting vaccinated. Yeah, that's the challenge, right? So if you think about herd immunity, depending on what scientists you talk about, we need to get about 90 percent of the population vaccinated. Uh, right now, there's about a, a hesitancy about about 30 percent that I'm hearing uh, the mm -hmm. latest statistics. So to get 90 percent, we have to eat into that 30 percent, about 20 percent, right? And so that's the work that we're doing right now. There are some glimmers of hope. Um, African-Americans, for example, um, who have had, uh, for all very good reasons, a mistrust of the healthcare system, back in November, uh, 40 percent said they were going to get the vac uh, vaccine. The, the most recent numbers I saw said 60 percent. So we're beginning to make some progress, but there's still work to, to be so, done. So address that question very specifically, because I know in New York, for example, that there's a disproportionate number of African-Americans and Latinx individuals who are more at risk, disproportionate number who haven't gotten the vaccine yet. They're, they are under-indexing. Is that true in North Carolina at this point? It's true all over the country, unfortunately. And that's why you've got to be really, really intentional about your strategies to reach those uh, communities of color. So, for example, we have roving bands that uh, we're working with this coalition of churches. There are about 60 churches that are African-American and Latinx. And so we're going to their parking lots and, and we're, we're uh, really saying, tell us where we need to go. And in our roving bands, and think about a physician office basically on wheels and we go to where, where we're needed, 74% of the people that we're vaccinating are people of color. And then when 
when we've done the mass vaccination events, say at Bank of America Stadium, we've preferentially opened the schedule to those churches and other uh, other vulnerable communities. So you've got to be really intentional about the strategy. The one thing that I'm proud working together with Honeywell, the Panthers, and Motor Speedway, we put together a playbook. Uh, Andy Slavitt, who's on the uh, President Biden's uh, Coronavirus Task Force, asked for sort of what are the key lessons learned. And so we shared that a couple weeks ago. He shared that with the governors. Uh, and we're hoping that, that there's some insights there that can help uh, the, the country do this well. So, Gene, if you would take a, a half step back here from the specifics of the vaccination and talk about health care provision more generally in this time of the pandemic and beyond. We now have a new stimulus bill, $1.9 trillion, has a fair amount of money in there actually to subsidize some uh, of the, the exchanges so that people can afford health care. Do you see a shift going on because of the stimulus bill in your business? Yeah, I mean, I think we're really excited that the stimulus bill has a number of important provisions, including, you know, additional dollars for 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 distribution of the vaccine. And there's some other uh, uh, parts of that that includes helping some of these community based centers that are really been struggling and, and also rural care. So we're, we're excited about that. The, what we didn't see in that is additional uh, relief for providers. Uh, and uh, to the extent that we would hope we've been on the front line of this health systems. And so we're still not out of the woods. So we're, we're hoping to to work with the administration to have other uh, opportunities for providing additional support to the to health systems like ours because we're still very much in the battle. What about the cost of health care? Uh, we hear from some people that with the move to telehealth, which seems to have really ramped up during the pandemic, that we may actually finally be able to bend that cost curve a little bit. Do you, are you finding that in North Carolina? Yeah, I mean, I think we could spend the next hour talking about the cost of healthcare and affordability. We we do know that it's a multifactorial uh, issue that includes pharma, that includes insurance companies, includes providers. We all own a piece of that. But I think that what we learned during the pandemic is that we can provide care in vastly different ways. Uh, for example, we started um, when we when we had some challenges with occupancy, bed occupancy. We started this hospital at home program. We've seen fifty thousand patients in their home during this COVID, uh, and that's just a, a different sort of way to deliver care. So we really think the learnings that we've had through this through this past year will carry forward and, among other things, will we'll help with the affordability of health care. Uh, this has been a tragedy for the country, for the world, given the number of people who have become sick, have been hospitalized and have died. At the same time, if I can put it in business terms, will the health care industry, will your company come out of this pandemic stronger than it went in? We, that's our goal. Um, I think um, we, we, we are seeing some confidence return to, to patients coming into the hospitals. Uh, we are making very significant investments in our community that we actually haven't stopped. Um, we are building a, a new medical school together with Wake Forest uh, uh, University School of Medicine in Charlotte. We're one of the largest cities in the, in, the, in the country that does have a medical school and an innovation district. So we're actually making the investments now that I think will continue to add jobs and to, and to help us economically going forward. What's the biggest development we should be looking forward to in healthcare over the next five years? I think, you know, we've, we've learned um, this whole, you, you highlighted it, telehealth. Um, uh, we've been investing in telehealth for the last decade. I think um, the, the, the revolution that's going to occur in simulation and telehealth and mobile health is going to be unlike anything we've, we've, we've seen. So it's excited to be essentially on the frontier of that, of that change. We know healthcare needs to change. And, and, and this is the time that I think we can, we can make some pretty definitive um, uh, fundamental structural uh, 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 rebalancing if you will, to serve our communities better. Okay, Mr. Woods, thank you so very much for being with us. Truly appreciate it. It was very helpful. Eugene Woods, he's CEO of HM Health. Coming up, we're going to talk about the future of crypto regulation under President Biden with Tim Massett. He is former CFTC chairman. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We want to go back for another check on the markets with Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. So, Abigail, I mentioned the Nasdaq, but I didn't mention it enough. Boy, what is going on? It's unbelievable. Stocks are really on fire today, David, especially that tech-heavy Nasdaq. But the S&P 500 at this point up 2%, so a big gain there. But that Nasdaq up even more, up about 4%. It's best day of the year, the best day since early November. Some of the more specific tech-heavy uh, indexes, they're up the best day. The Sox, the New York Bank Index, the Golden Dragon uh, China ETF, the best day since last summer, last spring. Investors want all in on technology. 
but this was not the case yesterday and it has everything to do with yields. When yields rise, it really brings into question valuation, a repricing of risk that has caused investors to rotate out of growth and technology and into the banks. So interestingly, today we have yields down a little bit. We have this huge rally for technology. Again, the best day of the year. On the year, though, it's a different story. If we take a look at the S&P 500 versus the equal weighted S&P 500, uh, which places less <laughs> emphasis on technology, yesterday that equal weighted index putting an all-time high, a record high, and on the year you can see it really outperforming the S&P 500. So that's that move into value, into some of the small caps, and away from the growth. That's the, uh, the bigger uh, theme of the year. Again, though, today a little bit of an inverse of it. And on the inverse of it today, Today with this risk taking back into growth, not only is the tech stock climbing, David, but it's also Bitcoin. Bitcoin uh, just really climbing high on the year, up about 86%. Very extended though, David. We haven't used the word frothy in a while, but I was just taking a look at a chart of Bitcoin. You know how much I love it. 125% above its 200 day moving average. Wow. Pretty overbought, pretty overextended. Let's see if these gains can continue. You and your technicals, Abigail Doolittle. Thank you so much for that report on the market. So let's stay on that subject of Bitcoin. It's up over $50,000. Actually, $54,000 was in change last time I checked. Even as some people say, we need to start some regulating of it. Tim Massett has been looking at that question from his position as research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. Mr. Massett served as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury and then as the Chair of the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission under President Obama. So, Tim, thank you so much for being with us. You've taken a pretty close look at crypto and particularly uh, the Apple's attempt to go into this. Uh, what have you concluded? Well, I think the main problem here is that the crypto industry doesn't have the same standards that we have in the securities and derivatives markets. And, you know, those standards have really ensured transparency and integrity in trading and reliability of information. So while I'm all for the crypto industry developing, uh, I think we need a better framework around it so that we do have uh, better standards and, and investors you know, can be assured uh, that they're not going to be subject to manipulation or fraud or other kinds of problems. We just don't have that today. Where are those standards going to come from? Do they need to come from the government? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the problem in this country is we have uh, divided jurisdiction. The SEC has a little bit of the jurisdiction. The CFTC uh, that I used to chair has a little bit of the jurisdiction. Uh, Treasury under FinCEN deals with, you know, uh, illicit finance and AML standards, anti-money laundering. But even together, all the regulators in, in the U.S. don't have uh, sufficient jurisdiction. The cash market meaning when you go and buy Bitcoin for cash, that's essentially not regulated other than at the state level. And that's just not enough. Now, Europe has moved recently to develop more comprehensive standards. The UK also is doing that. We just need to do that in, the, in this country. We know how to do it. Um, it wouldn't take that much. And that would bring, uh, I think, greater assurance of transparency and reliability of information. What about the anonymity of Bitcoin? It can be used for illicit purposes. We had Ken Rogoff yeah. on, on Wall Street a couple of weeks ago. You probably know him up at Harvard, the economist. And he said he doesn't think the central banks can ever tolerate it because it's just anonymous and they can't deal right. with that. Well, I think that's right <clears throat> in the sense of it becoming money. I don't, I don't think Bitcoin is ever going to replace the dollar as money. It's just, you know, a speculative asset, quite frankly, uh, partly because it, it's scarce. You know, it's limited uh, in amount. I think uh, the Treasury Department uh, through FinCEN has done a good job of enforcing anti-money laundering standards to the best that they can. But that effort would really be helped if we had greater regulation over all of the exchanges. For example, exchanges in crypto assets don't have to have rules preventing wash trading. Uh, you know, we, we prevent those in, in uh, the securities markets and the derivatives markets. We don't want, you know, an investor uh, essentially trying to inflate volume or price by essentially trading uh, with itself or with an affiliate. But crypto exchanges aren't subject to those kinds of standards. Um, so that's the kind of problem we have. If you could control it all, you could decide, you're czar, where would you put the responsibility? Well, probably with the SEC. Um, frankly, the SEC or the CFTC um, is qualified to 
to do this, to uh, basically have greater jurisdiction over these exchanges. Um, and, you know, in this country, it's just kind of a, a historical accident that we have this divided uh, financial regulatory system where we have a lot of different agencies. But I think the most important thing is just to is just to have someone step in. And, you know, another big problem here is stable coins. Um, stable coins are a neat idea, the idea that you have a crypto uh, currency that's backed by the U.S. dollar. But there are no standards on the on whether that issuer has to really have those reserves. You know, when they say, for example, there's 35 billion tether coins out there. They're supposed to be backed by $35 billion, but we don't know for sure if they are. And there was a recent action by the New York Attorney General, which showed that at times, uh, a lot of that money had been loaned out to an affiliate. Uh, there's no audits of those reserves. So that's another type of problem that we really need to address. Uh, does the expansion of cryptocurrency, we talk about Bitcoin, but in general, cryptocurrency potentially pose a threat to the Federal Reserve? in terms of its well, being ability to really yeah. control the money flow? Well, you know, what you saw when Facebook announced its proposal for a stable coin called Libra was that the Federal Reserve and really central banks around the world really accelerated their efforts to in looking at central bank digital currencies. And that's really different. Uh, it's related. Uh, I think it's a very good development that we are looking at that. I think you know, we will see some kind of development there. There's lots of different models, uh, and it's important to really think about carefully what kind of structure would work in this country in terms of some sort of digital money. Um, but, you know, right now there's digital money for big institutions, but not for individuals. So, you know, I think we will see some sort of development on this front. Uh, but it's it's still a little ways off. So, so you talk about in your Brookings paper, you talk about the CBDC, the central bank digital currency. Uh, what is the advantage of that? If we had one tomorrow, what would it do for us we don't have now? It's a good, it's a good question because obviously we do have a lot of forms of electronic payments. But I think it's still, again, if done the right way, can be a tool for greater financial inclusion, getting more people access to the system. You know, it's a it's a tragedy in this country. We have 25% of the population is unbanked or underbanked. That's a big problem. So that's one thing. Second thing, it could bring more efficiency and it could just bring, you know, greater types of services uh, for people. Um, you know, it's, it's something, again, that I think we have to really look at very carefully because there are some problems with different designs. You could basically... Uh, set up a CBDC in a way that had the Federal Reserve issue it and, you know, it could actually cause uh, too much money to leave commercial banks. And uh, that could be a problem, you know, because we commercial banks lend, you know, create, create loans for businesses. So I think we want to keep a system where we have a central bank and we have a private banking system. But I think, you know, a digital dollar could be developed. Uh, along those lines. It's a fascinating subject. Uh, we really should keep talking about it so that I understand at least better than I do now. Tim Massett, he's former CFTC chairman. He's going to be staying with us, I'm delighted to say, for our second hour. We're going to talk to him about the lessons learned from the 2008-2009 great financial crisis, whether any of them apply today. This is Balance of Power, and we are on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Our chief Washington correspondent, Kevin Cerulli, hosts Sound On weekdays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Bloomberg Radio. And he's just taped an interview airing today with Senator Shelley Capito, Republican of West Virginia. Kevin is here now with a preview. So what did you learn from uh, Senator Capito? You know, it's interesting. Here we are on the cusp of the passage of the $1.9 trillion stimulus deal. Now, Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia, a Republican, was one of the Republicans President Biden invited to the White House to talk about stimulus. But I asked her about that bipartisanship feeling and whether or not this is an undeal. And take a listen to what she told me. 
I think it's totally done deal. I think it's 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 too bad too because this is if the president in his uh, in his inauguration speech said he wanted unity. He represents all the people. He represents all uh, all viewpoints. And yet, when we get into a point where we can really negotiate with him, and he had us to the White House to do just that, uh, it falls very very flat. Now, Senator Shelley Moore Capito is the top Republican on the uh, Committee for uh, the Environment and Public Works, which is going to have an instrumental part in terms of infrastructure, David. But candidly, uh, she told me that President Biden has yet to put a price tag on just how much money he wants to spend on infrastructure. Well, it's an important point because, as I understand at least, they're not going to be able to do that through reconciliation. So he might have been able to get away with it without bipartisanship on the, on the stimulus. He can't do that, I don't think, on the Build Back Better. No, he can't. And, and at a time in which Republicans are increasingly drawing questions to just how much government spending uh, is allocating for these types of programs, it's going to be an uphill battle uh, for him to get that done. Very interesting. Thank you so much to Kevin Zerulli, our chief Washington correspondent. Catch more of his interview with Senator Shelley Moore Capito on his radio program. It is Sound On, airs weekdays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Coming up here, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to continue our conversation with former CFTC hit Tim Massett about lessons he learned from his time at Treasury during the great financial crisis. Plus, we'll speak with Catherine Baker, dean of the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio.